Sean Connery is the Director of Sports Performance for, Athlon uh, for Olympic Sports at University of Buffalo. In his current role, he is directly responsible for the physical development and sports nutrition efforts of the men's basketball and volleyball programs, as well as overseeing the sports performance department that serves all the student athletes at Buffalo. Previous previously, Coach Connery spent three seasons as an assistant sports performance coach at Eastern Michigan University, as well as as strength coach there, where he worked directly with the men's and women's basketball programs, as well as soccer and women's golf. Coach Connery joined the Eastern Michigan sports performance staff after serving as the assistant strength and conditioning coach at Christopher Newport University in Newport News, Virginia. During his time at CNU, Coach Connery was in charge of all aspects of strength and conditioning with men's and women's basketball, baseball, softball, men's soccer, women's lacrosse, men's and women's tennis, and assisted with football. Before that, Coach Connery held an internship and then a strength and conditioning coaching assistant position uh, for his first stint at EMU during the 2014 season. Before joining EMU, um, Coach was a strength and conditioning coach and served as a GA uh, at Springfield College. Uh, prior to his GA position, Coach Connery had several positions uh, through internships at the Buffalo Bills, Merrimack College, East Carolina University, and IMG Academy. Coach received a master's degree in strength and conditioning from Springfield College after earning a bachelor's uh, in exercise science at East Carolina. Coach is certified through the CSCCA, NSCA, um, and he is also a certified sports nutritionist through the ISSN. He is a PN Level 1 certified coach as well, um, and he holds certifications for USA Weightlifting, USA Track and Field, FMS, and RPR. So I really don't know what coach doesn't have. Um, <laughs> so I had coach over for dinner last night. We were up uh, till after midnight uh, just talking about his journey and all the things he's learned along the way. Uh, it was awesome for me just to pick his brain. Um, Fun fact about Coach, he won in high school, most distinct laugh. So if anybody here can get Coach going, you in for a treat. So uh, uh, without further ado, Coach Connolly. I appreciate it. Uh, thank you guys so much for having me. Thank you for the Hosher staff for inviting me down here. Uh, like Coach said, last night had a, a great dinner with Coach and his wife. I uh, really appreciate the hospitality. I was joking with them. I'm in the middle of basketball season right now, and this is my first off day in a couple months and so that, that just doesn't happen and uh, just by chance my girlfriend's back with her family in Brazil for the week so if I wasn't here and I didn't work like I don't know what I'd be doing in Buffalo so I'm, just, I'm excited to, to be here with you guys. Uh, Coach already went over my background the most important thing from this picture just like coach said with the blue collar lunch pail at Buffalo same culture blue collar shirts that we wear pre-game same exact culture same exact verbiage that we try and preach. So I actually gave this presentation in May at the CSCCA conference in Kansas City, and a little bit has changed. I was at Eastern Michigan, now I'm at Buffalo, so just like Jay-Z dropped volume one, and then within the year dropped volume two, <laughs> I'm dropping volume one, now I'm giving you volume two. You know, a, a lot has changed, not just the, the jersey or the colors, but um, really our process around our data, which is the big takeaway from this has changed because we got new players around our data. And players not meaning athletes, players meaning who's accessing the data, what are we reporting, what are we collecting. Our whole process has changed a little bit because we're in a new organization. Um, my view of monitoring has evolved. So, you know, traditional sports science monitors for me started in 2013 when I was an intern with the Buffalo Bills. And at my first day on the job, Coach Siano grabs me and says, we're gonna step in a meeting now going over GPS. And I'm in grad school at Springfield College. The only thing I knew about GPS was the Garmin that I used to navigate to Buffalo. <laughs> I didn't know what catapult was. I had no idea why they were even you know, quantifying that type of stuff. Uh, so needless to say, I learned a lot about sports science technologies then. Uh, but the mistake I made, I thought, you know, being in the NFL, it's so expensive. There's no way I could take what I learned in Buffalo and apply it as a GA at Springfield College. I didn't understand what they were trying to quantify, why they were trying to quantify it. I just thought it was a, a ton of money. Eventually, though, I started looking at data. The mistake I made early on was I would look at just one piece of data. I thought one data set, one metric was going to tell me everything I needed to know to make a successful intervention with our athletes. Eventually, I smartened up and realized I need to collect as much data as possible, you know, create a big, robust database uh, to, to make player profiles. But really, at that point in time, I just I created a lot of extra work for myself. All the data wasn't actionable, all of it wasn't necessarily meaningful, and I just created a lot of extra work. It kind of took away from me being a strength coach, and I spent a lot of time just diving into data. 
Where I'm at now though, like I said, the process around data collection is the most important thing. As a strength coach, you don't want to get bogged down and spend hours, hours of your day not on the floor coaching athletes and just you know, analyzing data. we got to set up a solid logistical process for us to quantify all the data that we're looking at. Because what I realize, data is not the issue. You hear a lot of coaches kind of bash GPS or bash uh, heart rate or, or whatever data you're collecting. They're saying, oh yeah, it's not useful. Well, the only way it's not useful is if you don't have a process that is going to you know, sustain that. Data is not an issue because we collect data all the time as strength coaches. Every time an athlete comes you know, in the weight room for the first time, we get some type of anthropometric assessment on them. Like Coach talked about, we want to quantify body weight and, or body mass because de improving body composition is going to be correlated with improving performance. So we want to quantify that. We're going to quantify where their movement's at because you know, we want to see if the training program is going to improve their movement quality because improved movement quality is probably correlated with decreased injury risk. And then all the performance metrics in the weight room, like we coaches showed a ton of data that we have uh, on lifting and our KPIs and our performance metrics. Data has never been the issue, but as a strength coach, our logistical process of collecting all this stuff is relatively straightforward, and some of it is only done a couple times throughout the year. The data that I'm talking about is stuff that needs to be done every single day, so that logistical process really needs to be in place. My step into more traditional you know, sports science monitoring uh, really comes just like Coach said. Coach gave a great presentation on VBT, and that's really where I started. My first full-time job was at Christopher Newport University in Virginia. I was a strength coach for 10 teams, and when I say I was a strength coach for 10 teams, I literally mean every single day I would coach 10 teams. Every hour and the hour, a new team came in for 10 hours. That, that was my day every day. My first full-time job, though, what I realized when we talk about like a dose-response relationship, a lot of the athletes that I saw, the only interaction I had with them was in the weight room. I didn't have the luxury to go see them at practice or see them outside. I'm just seeing them in the weight room. And there wasn't really a direct correlation with where we were at in a given training block and the readiness state that I would see them come in with. And when you got over 300 athletes, I'm thinking, how can I be a better strength coach? How can I better auto-regulate the, the training stimulus? So coach mentioned it, the, everyone's got a finite stress cup. So what I realized is the stress from training that I pour in one athlete's cup could barely fill it up. Same stress that I pour into another athlete's cup could overflow it, right? So I'm like, okay, I need to manage stress and then look at allostatic load. I need to start quantifying all the other stressors that are going on in the athlete's life so I can be a better strength coach. And this is where I think things get a little confusing because some coaches are, you know, I don't want to go tell a basketball coach how to do their job. Well, I never got into this to tell a basketball coach how to do their job. I got into it to say, hey, how can I be a better strength coach and better auto-regulate and serve my athletes? We talked about this at lunch, you know, load management. So I want to quantify load. Load management is such a big buzzword and big hot topic in basketball right now. And, and there's a lot of misconceptions about it. So I just pulled some recent articles when you Google load management. No one knows what it is. The second article says load management is just a fancy term for rest. I would argue most strength coaches would say load management is actually our job to properly prepare our athletes for specific volumes and intensities during the season. If we don't have a proper off-season to build chronic preparedness, that's when we have issues handling certain loads. I wrote this down the other day. My definition of it could change tomorrow, but to me, load management is the appropriate periodizations of volume and intensities to build chronic preparedness for the demands of the season. But the big thing is it's pre prescribed in a fluid manner that accounts for changes in player readiness state. So building off the last presentation, readiness state, auto-regulation, taking into account where that player's fatigue is at is going to be really important in how we are prescribing certain volumes and intensities. So load management to me is really what I'm talking about today. I'm talking about readiness and recovery and training load. And so we talk about you know, stress response adaptation. That's all I'm trying to do. Again, my first step into all this was looking at velocity-based training, and then I worked for a basketball coach that wanted to start collecting heart rate data. And early on, I realized, you know, to me, heart rate training is to conditioning, what velocity-based training is to lifting. And, and what I mean by that is, coach already talked about in the last presentation, when you quantify bar velocity, it's naturally occurring. You don't gotta quantify it and you can still run a training program successfully. But when you quantify it and you look at it, now we have better insights into what the actual training adaptation is that, that's occurring. So Brian Mann had a, a famous study talking about, he thought, you know, power cleans were gonna be co correlated with increased vertical jump. Uh, a movement that they're doing to improve power should be improved with something that's showing their, their KPI power. It didn't because they looked at the power clean 
uh, bar speed and it was more an absolute strength thing than working on power. So maybe if they quantified the bar velocity and actually prescribed it based off meters per second, they would know the adaptation they're looking at. When we start looking at heart rate, we can do the same thing. Heart's responding naturally during conditioning, whether we quantify it or not, but we can start to look at the training effect and see if a, a session is more aerobic versus anaerobic. And we can start to quantify all these different things. So heart rate was kind of the next progression for me after VBT. Uh, and it made me a better strength coach, helped my, condition, my, my personal conditioning sessions. But now where I'm at, it's really just managing the load of practice more than just my conditioning session. It's more integrated. But I talk about a st stress response adaptation. In my role now, bottom right hand corner, I got a, a sample practice plan for Buffalo basketball. My coach made me blur this stuff out. He didn't want to give away all our secrets. But all we try to do is we want to quantify stress. That's the first thing. What's actually happening? So that's the practice plan. What are we actually doing? Now the heart rate's going to show us what's the response and the adaptation. So that's what I take to the coaching staff. That's all my role is. Right? They look at me as a basketball coach that's in charge of all physical prep. So I got to know what's going on on the court and be fully integrated with them, but give them all the physical outputs. So before diving into, or for you guys, before trying to add any you know, other kind of training load monitoring, and I'll, and I'll just tell you this completely straight up. If you're a coach that's in the weight room and you can't make it out to practice and you've got, like, if you were in my situation at CNU, velocity-based training is the way to go. Everything I'm talking about here probably isn't as applicable. It's good to know about it. I learned about it, and now in my current role, I have to use it. But if you want to be a better strength coach and program for your athletes, velocity-based training is going to accomplish a lot of this. My role now is to kind of quantify everything I practice and report that to the coaching staff. But again, before adding anything to your system, identify your infrastructure. This is the biggest pitfall in all of this. Number one, can we get clean data? If we can't get clean data, then we're going to be making decisions off metrics that are invalid. So a big thing we see is like with our heart rate belts, if athletes' heart rate belts are constantly falling down, we're not getting good data, why would we use heart rate? We've got to make sure we set up our system so that we are getting good data from the heart rate belts. Can we get consistent data? If we are only getting a data set every now and again, we're not seeing the full picture. I want to make sure I get data every single day. Now, what's going to stop us from getting consistent data? Some of our resources and logistics. Like if we're just talking heart rate, if I'm the only one that's in charge of implementing the heart rate system and I can't physically put the heart rate belts at the athlete's lockers pre-practice because I got another lift group, because I got a staff meeting, whatever it is, now there's a drop off in data, data's not gonna be consistent, we're probably not making the, the best decision. So we need to know what resources and logistics we have. Resources meaning people, who is there an athletic trainer helping me impl uh, implement the data? Do I have an intern, student managers? Who's gonna help do the logistical side of things? Resources meaning money. When I was at CNU, our basketball coach was the one that wanted to start diving into heart rate training. We didn't have a budget for it as a strength staff, so what resources did we have? Well, we had a relationship with the local hospital who ended up funding it for us. So we got to be you know, efficient with our resources. So logistics, resources, all this, identify your infrastructure. To me, this is what is going to create the process. And to me, the process around all our data is these four things. Collect. What are we going to collect? How are we going to collect it? The next big step is review. Bring all the data together and let's see what's actually going on. Again, stress response. How are we responding? Let's see what we're actually seeing first. Then communicate it, report it to all the appropriate parties, coaching staff, athletes, athletic trainer, who it is. The last thing is recalibrate. So that is our intervention. That's what we're changing. And I just call it recalibrate because as a strength coach, we've all, all of us have already presented like our 52-week periodization. We already kind of know our periodization model, where we're trying to take our athletes. Our coaching staff has the same thing. They kind of know where we're trying to go with our practice plans. All the data is going to show is, do we hit the target? Are we slightly off target? Do we need to recalibrate? Again, stress. Quantify the stress. See the response. See if we need to make any adjustments. I think a big thing people uh, mistake early on, besides looking at the infrastructure, is they want to start collecting data, and they want to go right ahead and start changing things. And I've seen that even this year where we added Catapult GPS uh, into our system now at Buffalo. I've had it for a month and everyone's asking me about all the changes I'm making. And I'm like, you've literally got to follow the process and just see what's going on first, start communicating it, matching it up with everything else before we start just making baseless changes. So step one, what are we going to collect? Again, you want to paint the biggest picture possible, so as long as your system supports it, you want to get as much data as possible, you want to get readiness and training load data, and you want to get objective and subjective measures. Obviously, objective measures, 
might be a little bit more reliable. Subjective measures might tell the full story a little bit better. So we get objective and subjective measures from a readiness and a training load standpoint. And then from a training load standpoint, internal and external uh, training load metrics. External training load, again, what is the work that got done? Player load, speeds, distances, all that kind of stuff. What's the work that got done? Internal training load, how the heart rate responded. What got done, how the body responds. So first thing, wellness questionnaire. This, I was saying at lunch, is probably the cheapest, most efficient, and best thing I do as a strength coach. Now I send this out to athletes in a Google form which is connected to a Google Sheet. I can see it in real time. Uh, the way our day is set up, athletes are with me every single day at 7 a.m. I meet them in the locker room. They already have this on their phone every day. By the time I get in the locker room at 7 a.m., they already filled out this 10 question questionnaire. This subjectively quantifies the stress that's going on in their life. We're all gonna get an objective measure that I'm gonna talk about in a second, but here we get better insights on sleep, quantity and quality, nutrition, quantity and quality, hydration, mood, stress, physical fatigue, muscle soreness. The, the single best thing that I think we have in our system is question number 10, pain identification. That's an open-ended question where they can respond and say, hey, my lower back is hurting. Uh, I hurt my wrist last night, whatever it is. So we practice every day. I'm in constant communication with our athletic trainers, but sometimes things pop up. And when I'm lifting the team at 7 a.m. before anyone else is in the building, I need to know if I got to make any adjustments. We talk about player buying. I want the athletes to take ownership and, and see that the data is getting used. So when I see something come up and a guy say, hey, my lower back's really hurting, or I see six guys say their lower back's really hurting, maybe I, when we hit the weight room, I go off the script and we do five extra minutes of mobility pre-lift or, or whatever it is. So the other big thing with that is as soon as a player identifies any pain, the athletic trainer gets flagged in the way our, our schedule is set up, seven to eight o'clock lift, eight to nine o'clock is treatments. And so if you say, hey, my left knee is hurting, well now eight o'clock then, instead of meeting with academics, you immediately go to the athletic trainer and you got treatment with them. Because anything that we do, we want to make sure it's just an acute pain and not a chronic thing that we're constantly dealing with. We want to be proactive and constantly working to make sure our athletes are better and get them, get them healthy. The objective side of things, uh, with First Beat, we're able to look at uh, HRV. So with the First Beat heart rate belt, it's already waiting in the guys' lockers. They already filled out their questionnaire. Meet them in the locker room at 7 a.m. They got the heart rate belts on. It is a three-minute resting heart rate test that gives us these three metrics. Quick recovery test, percentage recovered, which you see on the bottom here. So stop late approach, kind of flags our athletes where the readiness state is at. We also see what the resting heart rate is. And then RMSSD is that actual metric for HRV. What I like about this is it's only three minutes, and I just call it three mindful minutes with the guys. They come in at 7 a.m., we focus on diaphragmatic breathing, I do some visualization, trying to get their mind right for the day, and it's just every single day it's a part of our system, what we do. So now we have subjective readiness, we have objective readiness, they leave the heart rate belts, we jog it to the weight room, we got a lift. In lift, one or two times a week, we're gonna do a counter movement jump for readiness. We do three different types of jumps. The counter movement jump is what we're tracking for readiness. We also do a squat jump or a non-counter movement jump, and then we do a drop jump. In season programming, we look at deviations in those to help individualize the stimulus a little bit. So if we've got uh, more of our elastic guys where their, their drop jump or their counter movement jump is extremely high or above the non counter movement jump, uh, we know that they're a super elastic athlete, maybe more base level strength is what's actually gonna help their performance. Or on the opposite, if you know a, a counter movement jump and a squat jump are, are almost very similar, Maybe it's like a really muscular driven athlete. We need to do more low level plyos and make them a little bit more elastic. So helps us program in season. But uh, from a, a Z score, we look at deviations and that just as another filter for player readiness. And then if I got time at the end of the presentation, I go into all of this. This isn't something that's done every day, but we get a baseline on this for our athletes, a lifestyle assessment with a first beat bodyguard. It's essentially just like an EKG that they wear for 24 hours. So we get a baseline on all our guys with this, but it's gonna give us two crucial metrics. 24 hour stress recovery balance, and then overnight recovery. Everyone's always talking, you know, preaching, getting good sleep, and we need to track sleep, and uh, you know, wellness questionnaire, we're tracking how much they slept, but this is actually gonna show what type of recovery they got during their sleep, but also the stress that happened to them during the day that actually impacted their sleep. So just like, I have this conversation all the time. We talk readiness. I don't really care if an athlete is in poor readiness if we really don't see a deviation in on-court performance. So like if, if you come in with chronic low readiness, but your field goal percentage or plus minus whatever basketball stat is still really high, 
maybe you can kind of get away with that. But when we start seeing that drop, now we do want to set you up for more optimal state of recovery. Sleep is going to be the same thing. We got athletes that, we, you know, get eight hours of sleep, get eight, eight hours of sleep. You get an athlete that gets six hours of sleep, but has, you know, close to 100% overnight recovery, boom, great, you got good recovery in those six hours. I would rather have you six hours and 100% recovery than an athlete that gets eight or nine hours and is at 40% recovery. So the big thing here is we constantly talk about sleep. Sleep is our biggest modality of recovery. We want to make sure we are educating our athletes to get them the, the best sleep possible. Just a sample graph on the bottom uh, right. That red all the way up until the purple line shows that they're getting stress responses all the way up until they go to sleep. So how can we better prepare them to handle stress. Maybe they think playing Xbox before bed is gonna help them de-stress and get good sleep. Here we're trying to get data to show them that hey, we need to you know, handle life a little bit better. Don't avoid stress, but set up pockets of parasympathetic time to actually improve your sleep. So that was all our readiness stuff. Now getting into training load. First thing we're looking at, internal training load. Again, heart rate, we use first beat. And you can get tons and tons of metrics from first beat. Everything I try and look at, I break down to two metrics, volume and intensity. So TRIMP is training impulse, that's our volume, that's our training load for internal, for heart rate. Obviously intensity, let's just put a minute on it, TRIMP per minute. So if my TRIMP for the day is 100, your TRIMP for the day is 100, but you know, you had a two hour session, I had a one hour session, my session was obviously way more intense, so we gotta start accounting for that. Here's some kind of normative data for, again, we try and stop late all our guys, red, yellow, green, for what trim, trim per minute and, and the different intensity zones that they're in. Uh, a lot of our data is gonna be predicated on our guys, so uh, different sports, obviously, you're gonna see different data. Different types of basketball play the way you, uh, you run things, obviously, you're gonna see different types of data, but this is what we're seeing with our guys. This is our internal metrics. External metrics, uh, we're using Catapult for the first time this year. So now again, quantifying what's actually going on and object objectively quantifying it, and then looking at the internal response. Just like heart rate, we're gonna do volume and intensity. So volume for uh, our Catapult metric is gonna be player load. That's a good basketball metric because it's not just quantifying the speeds or the distance that they run, it's just actual movement. So I can be a post player in the post, and any movement I do is increasing my player load player load per minute, that obviously is the intensity of that session. And then just like uh, with our heart rate analytics, we're trying to quantify both of those and match them up together. Those were all objective measures of training load, just like recovery now. I wanna look at a subject to measure of training load. If you don't have any of the, the finances to get any of that data, this is, again, built out in Google form. I text the athletes post-practice, a simple session, RPE. Athletes gotta fill out one question. How difficult was practice today on a scale of one to 10? That's all they fill out. I got it set up in my Google Sheet. So it is whatever the athlete filled out, multiplied by the duration of practice, gives you the arbitrary number of uh, athlete session RPE. One thing that I've added in the last couple of years is I send one to the athletes, I send one to the coaching staff as well. The big thing is I want the, the coaches to start getting educated on how they're applying stress and have the coaches say, hey, I think this is what practice, you know, the intensity and duration volume was. Here's how it matches up with the, the athletes. Did those match up? Try and just do as many filters as I can to educate the coaching staff on how they are applying stress. <clears throat> so logistical procedure, with all of our training load data and where we're taking it, what I'm doing, what I'm reporting to the coaching staff, none of it would be possible if not for this. We need to timestamp all of our practice plan. Now, when I worked football, it, it was much smoother where if you had a football practice plan, and you had a certain amount of periods and they were you know, for a certain amount of time, you could essentially give someone a practice plan and that's, that's where it was. Basketball is all over the place. We got the coaches going off script, going over the time. I should have put a picture in of what it looks like when it's all scribbled at the end of practice. But again, the, the implementation of it, this is a student manager, Miriam, she's an um, operations manager. She runs our, our scoring clock and she sits there and timestamps all the data for me. So while I'm in practice, I can be working out guys, I can be bouncing around, whatever the coaches need me to do, I don't physically have to be standing there just checking things off, I have someone doing that for me. At the end of practice, she gives me the timestamp sheet, and then I gotta go into the cloud and then match up all of our metrics with the timestamp. So, you know, my procedure then, I got a budget for 10 minutes post-practice to timestamp our catapult data, timestamp our first beat data. So the top catapult, that long orange line is our practice, I just drag for the duration and, and start adding in what our different drills were, how long they were, and adding the players into it. 
and first beat, the same thing. Now I drag an orange bar and I start adding in what the practice drill was. Now what this does is after a full you know, preseason of data, I can literally pull and say, hey, this drill is this volume and this intensity, or here's what the norms are. And then now as we go later in the season, if we see deviations from it, now we can make a better informed decision. But this is all the stuff I'm giving to the coaching staff. That was my procedure. The athlete's procedure is pretty straightforward. Again, 7 a.m., they come in the building, they knock out the subject of wellness questionnaire, heart rate belt's already waiting for them, they knock out the QRT, they leave the belt, we hit a lift, then it is uh, training room, academics, and then they come back for practice, they put the heart rate belt and the compression shirt on, we got practice, post-practice, they fill out the session RPE, they leave the heart rate belt, and uh, they put the compression shirt in the wash. Just a part of our daily process for them. It's not adding in any extra stress for them, just a part of what we do. So now, let's review the data, let's get everything together. So everything that we looked at right now, you know, our subjective and our objective measures. Subjective data, I love Google for this. I was just telling uh, some guys at lunch, our IT department is trying to get me off the Google platform because Google technically owns the data, we don't own the data, so they want me to kind of shift platforms, but Google made it so easy for me to build out these forms, text to the athletes, it makes it look like it's an app, but in real time, the form gets sent to a Google Sheet that I could see and easily put into uh, our data dashboard in Excel. Body weight jump metrics, we immediately import into Excel. First beat goes into its own cloud. Catapult goes into its own cloud. And then it's easy to pull that data and put it into our Excel dashboard. So the big thing is, we got all these different data sets. They all got to communicate. You could spend a lot of money uh, on buying some type of uh, athlete management system and, and getting that there. We don't have the money right now. Ideally, we would. For me, I'm just building everything out in Excel and getting the data to interact. So as we review the data, you gotta you know, put context around it and then look for trends. Putting context and normalizing the data. Normalize it from a team standpoint, group standpoint, and then an individual. Obviously, what are the team norms, but then breaking down you know, the groups. High minute guys, low minute guys, positions. Most important thing is looking at individual uh, athletes and how they're responding. Trends, you know, looking at uh, acute and chronic workload ratios, which I'll get into. How does our subjective and objective metrics interact? Internal, external is the new one we're looking at. And then my favorite piece that we added is the physiological data. How does it match up with game data? So looking at team training load norms, this is what our heart rate trip values. Uh, so this is a normal week during our conference season. So in the MAC conference, we play on Tuesdays and Saturdays. Tuesdays, obviously game day, I'm gonna, our, our team norm is going to be around 200 trip. That's the training load for that day. Now in a normal week, Sunday is going to be our lightest day. Why? Because we just came off uh, of a game, and now we still got to practice and start prepping for the next game. So Sunday is going to be our light day. We're going to ramp it up on Monday to make sure that we're ready to go on Tuesday. Wednesday's our off day. Guys are in the facility, recovery, extra lift, whatever we got to do. Thursday is going to be our most intense day because we're coming off of an off day. We've got to review everything from Tuesday's game. We still got a lot of work to do for Saturday, but then we got to scale it back a bit so we don't burn the guys out so we're able to perform at an optimal level on Saturday. And that's 75 on Friday. A couple of slides, I'll show you where we got that number from. Team recovery, same thing. Got to put some norms around where you're at in the year. In preseason, you want to make sure that your training, uh, your recovery values are kind of fluctuating relatively high because dose response relationship, we impact more or less where the recovery is at. It's just 42 days to get in 30 practices, so we're the ones that are applying the most stress. That's going to be in contrast to what we see where we're at right now in our non-conference play where we're adding in games. So what's that do? Obviously, we're fluctuating high versus low minute guys. There's a stress right there. We're traveling all over the country. It's an added stress. You could have three games in five days. So the, the recovery that we're seeing from a team standpoint is all over the place in non-conference. It'll normalize a little bit once we get to that conference training load like I talked about. But just, again, put into context where you're at. Right now, if we're seeing really low recovery, that's probably expected and we're not freaking out about it because we put in context with everything else and where we're at. But in context, the groups, again, this is a, a big thing. Instead of looking at team averages, training load recovery, break it up into position or break it up into playing time. So from a training load standpoint, if we're just looking at practice, our guards and our bigs training loads are going to be different. Even if we have a team practice, for a lot of the time we break off into separate skill groups, so they're getting a separate stress there. And the demands of the game might be a little bit different. So what we've seen from the trim values is the, the bigs practice, their trim values, are going to be slightly higher than our guards values. It's not going to be the same. 
It's a strength coach, we need to know that because when, you know, I schedule lifts first thing in the morning, I think it's a good schedule for the guys, but if when I was at Eastern Michigan, we would lift the guys post-practice. If I got the guys coming in post-practice, I need to know, hey, the, the bigs are probably a little bit more burnt than the guards. Maybe they should come in pre-practice if I can. Just got to take all that type of stuff into consideration. Recovery, again, looking at total recovery uh, at this point of the year, not really valuable because we only play about eight guys. So there's eight guys that aren't playing. Their recovery should be good. So we need to break it up and see where our high minute guys recovery, where our low minute guys recovery is at, and look at deviations in that versus just the overall team average. But again, the most important thing, looking at individuals in the player pro profile, get everything, you know, green, yellow, and red, stoplight approach, just seeing where every athlete is at with all the metrics that we're collecting. You know, you've got to account for individual uh, variants. Z-scores are applied from a, a rolling seven-day average to most of the data that we collect. Uh, so the Z-score is going to uh, hold more weight. You know, if we look at a subjective wellness questionnaire, and you got athlete one in the blue, where they generally are reporting about the same thing every single day, versus the athlete two that's highly variant. Well, when athlete one, based on the Z-score, has a change, that change is gonna be weighed a lot more and be a lot more significant than athlete two who's highly variant. So as a strength coach, trying to interpret that, the Z-score puts a little bit more context around it. And then in Excel, it builds it out, and again, stoplight approach. All of our, our different metrics, we try and make a, a quick visual so we can see green, yellow, red, where they're, where they're at, how they're matching up, how they're handling the stress, where our training loads are at. And so this is something that is shared with the athletic trainers and the coaching staff. Now, acute to chronic workload ratio. This is uh, a big thing for us, a big thing that I communicate to our coaching staff. Um, so the acute chronic workload ratio, basically from a lot of research and, and Tim Gavitt's work, we know too fast of an increase in training load or too fast of a decrease in training load is correlated with injury risk. So as a strength coach, I think a lot of people think the data is constantly, we're pulling back, we're pulling back, we're pulling back. That's not, that's not it at all. We're trying to create chronic preparedness and handle higher training loads. So there's a protective value in being able to withstand high training loads. You need to handle the stress of the game. So there's kind of, they call it the sweet spot between 0.8 and 1.3 where the, the training loads are a little bit more protective than if training loads are above 1.3 uh, or below 0.8. So what that means is if we got three weeks and we're used to, say, running five miles, and then on this week we drop it to one mile, now our tr acute chronic workload ratio drops significantly, and now we're in a danger zone. We're more likely to get injured because of that huge decrease in our training load. Versus if we ramped it up to running 10 miles, we're only used to running five miles. Now when on the opposite spectrum, now we're still at an increased risk of injury uh, because we spiked the training load too fast. So this is what I'm reporting to the coaching staff. The coaches obviously are gonna play, uh, place the most amount of stress on the athletes. So educating them on how they are applying the stress of practice, proper periodization of their, their uh, uh, preseason uh, practice plans, all that type of stuff is really where we're going with our data. Don't have the batteries died. This is still not going on. Yeah, I got you. So next thing, looking at subjective and objective data. How do those things match up? I think this is really important. Talking about athlete session RPE, the free thing that I did in Google, matched up with some heart rate data that we got that cost a couple thousand dollars. For the most part, those are going to match up pretty well. And when looking at a lot of the, the literature, those do match up really well with each other. So, and it makes sense, because we educate our athletes on how they report the data, what the, the training loads are. So what we're seeing from a, a reporting standpoint is what we're seeing from uh, a heart rate standpoint. Sean, should be good. Sounds good? Cool. Appreciate yeah. it. Perfect. Now, that's in contrast to our subjective data, so, uh, our, our uh, recovery data. Subjective recovery data versus objective recovery data is a bit noisier. So again, that's why I like to take as much data as possible, put context around it. Even though it's pretty noisy, you can see it's starting to trend with each other a little bit, but this is athlete one, athlete two, the guy that kind of reported the same thing every day, his quick recovery test, or looking at his HRV, doesn't necessarily match up with what he's reporting. But if we look at QRT, QRT trends pretty similar between the two, that's why we look at it. I think to me this makes sense, the subject of wellness questionnaire, 
uh, going back to looking at how they sleep and everything, inherently, if you are reporting you only got six hours of sleep, it's driving your score down, but we might have athletes that are adapted and get good recovery in those six hours. So the uh, subject of wellness questionnaire is great to provide information, but it inherently drives down the score in certain situations. That's why we like to take both to make our informed decisions. Now where we're at now this year, looking at external and internal uh, uh, training loads and how they match up. Heart rate, GPS, they match up, they correlate with each other, which they should. But what we look at is called a training efficiency index, uh, essentially looking at external training load divided by the internal training load uh, squared to the average um, slope of the relationship between log transform variables. That's easily done in Excel. There's lots of videos on YouTube that explain this. this the basic premise here is if we have external training load and we have internal training load, we want to make sure and we can easily see where our, our fitness level is at throughout the year. So external training load, the work that got done, everything gets put into certain quadrants. If we're now three months into the season and we are seeing an increase in external training load, meaning we properly progressed our athletes to handle high volumes and we're adding stress as we go and now we're experiencing higher external training loads, we're doing more at practice, but we are seeing a decrease in their trip values or their internal response to that high training load, they're gonna fall into this quadrant, which means we're increasing fitness. Does that make sense? We're doing more, but our heart rate is responding less, fitness increase. We can also see the opposite. If we're getting later on in the year, and generally, like by the time we get in late February, March, like we're really scaling back practice a lot. So now if it's first week of March, and external training load is gonna be decreasing, but we're still seeing higher internal training responses to it, now we see that detraining effect and now we maybe need to focus on fitness a little bit more. So that's how we're matching up our internal and external data. Really simple way to uh, tell the coach if there's a fitness or a fatigue issue and for us to know where our fitness is at without actually testing it during the year. So this is uh, what I was talking about earlier. The cool thing is you want to match up your physiological data with your performance data. So going back to uh, our training load values in non-conference and why on during conference on Friday, why we try and shoot for 75 on the trim uh, before going into a game on Saturday. This is actually from CNU, or I'm sorry, from uh, Eastern Michigan last year. Uh, we had a guy that, one of our main players, we needed him to play well and have a good game for us to win. He was a guy that we needed to get a lot of rebounds for us to win. So just looking at certain Saturday games, there'd be certain Fridays where a coach would either take the day completely off, There'd be days where we'd have a light practice. There'd be days where we had a, a more intense practice. But what I started noticing just from the eye test is, it, you know, the days that we took off, in the game Saturday, this guy, it took a long time to get his engine going. Like, he started real sluggish. Coach would say, hey, we're, we're giving him a rest on Friday, so he's fresh on Saturday. But then Saturday, he started super sluggish. Versus when we kind of cruised right into Saturday, he looked better. So I noticed that, so then I ran some numbers, and I looked at, okay, what was his trip value on Friday compared to his plus minus and his rebounds on Saturday. So plus minus is just a basketball stat saying, okay, at the entire time that I'm on the floor, did we outscore the other team or did the other team outscore us? So if I'm on the floor for 20 minutes, in those 20 minutes, if we outscored the other team by five, I got a, a plus five. If they outscored us by five, I got a minus five. So we looked at that with rebounds. You can see, first game, took off on Friday. On Saturday, he had a minus 15, so he didn't really help the on-court performance of the team and he only had two rebounds. Another game, 30, so real low trip value, plus minus improves a little bit, rebounds improved a little bit. Once we got up to 45, same thing, still negative, plus minus, but when we got in that 70 to 80 range, all of a sudden, plus minus is positive, so now we're actually contributing to winning, and rebounds, the stat we need him to do, he's actually doing. So this was just a cool thing for us to kind of help the coaching staff build out the week a little bit better. Now again, context is everything. You gotta put context around this type of data, like if game one we played Kansas and game six we played Binghamton, like there's gonna be a big difference, obviously, in the outcome, but this is all the kind of stuff that we're looking at and matching up performance data with our game data. So reporting, communicating, who are we communicating everything to? Obviously athletes, sports medicine staff, coaching staff. To me, athletes, is number one. I want them to take control of the data, whether we're talking lifting, data, I just I want them to take ownership of it. So data should lead to more conversations, more personal interactions, and athlete ownership. I want to, them to understand the training process, understand the, the cause and effect of their actions, and, and then take ownership of it. So 
from a recovery piece, again, the, uh, the wellness questionnaire is probably the best thing that we do because it starts to link things to them when, hey, when I'm not sleeping well, when I'm not eating all the right stuff, how am I feeling, what's all the other data kind of telling me. It's a constant athlete education that, that I'm giving to them. And from a training load standpoint, I mean, before every lift, I kind of break down what we're doing, where we're at, why we're there, to the point where now I'm like, okay, guys, we're three days out from the game. What day is today? Like, okay, intense day. Like, they all kind of know where we're at, how we're trying to load them, and, and what the logistical plan is on the court as well. From a sports medicine standpoint, again, driven by daily interactions, I'm actually super uh, uh, lucky right now. I work with Andy, who Andy did all the heart rate stuff at Buffalo the last few years before I got there. So now when we come together, like we're putting our heads together and we really are building out the system a lot better. But uh, again, the big thing, questionnaire pain identification, that gets sent to him. And so if guys are saying, hey, my knee's hurting and no one came to him and, and saw that, now we're making sure that they're getting to him to take care of their treatments and all that type of stuff. Our training load reports get sent to him. So he's just, all that means is he's just as educated on me with this, so we truly are like a sports performance team where we understand me applying a stress in the weight room, him dealing a little bit more with the recovery in the training room. We're, we're both speaking the same language, seeing the same things, and constantly communicating what we're seeing to our coaching staff. So reporting it to the coaching staff, uh, here's a sample email that I'll send out to the coaching staff on a daily basis. The acute chronic workload stuff is really uh, like the cornerstone of them understanding the training loads and, and its effect on our athletes. So it's such an easy visual for them to see where the athletes are at, are they in the ranges we're looking for, are they more in those danger zones, and then you know, how are we setting up our week to make sure that we are maintaining uh, those ranges. So me saying looking for a trip score about 100 tomorrow, we should be in a good spot for the game on Sunday. I mean these are just quick conversations that we have on a daily basis. Um, where I'm in a really good spot now. The coaching staff takes my input. They want this type of information. I'm not overstepping boundaries. I'm not telling the sport coaches what to do. This is just our relationship and how I'm breaking down the data to them. And again, going back to looking at session RPE, do it to the athletes, do it to the coaching staff, because the big thing is educating the coaching staff. Are we getting the results we expected? Most of the year, I would argue that the coaches think practice is much easier than the athletes think it is. This was from a year ago when I was at Eastern Michigan, uh, our first week of preseason data. And what we found is coaching staff thought that practice was going to be way tougher than it actually was for the athletes. Now, a lot goes into that. Number one, the, way, the style of basketball and the way we set up our annual plan at Eastern is completely different than at Buffalo. At Eastern, didn't do a whole lot on the court. Like literally no team practice all off season until August 1st. It was all individual work. So my role as a strength coach, like a lot of conditioning, like all that was my job. At Buffalo, we run full team practice all summer. Like you would think it was the preseason. So you talk about preparedness, chronically high values, like they're handling those demands rolling in. So two very different situations. But what we had here is coaches didn't take into account the level of preparedness that I got the athletes in all through June, July, August, September, and now when we hit on August 1st. The issue with this is, again, remember, session RPE matched up with our trip values. So if athletes now are seeing a drop in, uh, in what the session RPE is, that's probably what their trip values is, that's probably the adaptation now, and now we're having a detraining effect. So this all stemmed from a conversation last year, coaches were saying, man, like a week into practice, I don't think the guys are getting in better shape. And then I pulled this data and I'm like, well, yeah, it's been a breeze for them this week. It's a lot of teaching, a lot of instruction, a lot of standing around. We've done a good job all off season to increase that preparedness. Like we can really start to ramp up practice. So again, these are all the type of conversations we're trying to have, but it all comes, comes down to this. Are we getting the results we expected? The coaches are going to be applying the most stress to the athletes within their practice plan. The relationship I have right now is the way I broke down all my metrics, I need to do the same thing with our practice plan. The same way I got stoplight approach for you know, trim for our player load metrics, I gotta give uh, Coach Weitzel a red, yellow, green. Here's your high intensity drills, moderate intensity drills, light intensity drills, and have him start to be on those coaches staff meetings as he models out the week. And so this is an ongoing process, uh, but to me, you know, when you start looking at all this stuff, everything comes down to volume and intensity. And that makes sense to us as strength coaches, volume in the weight room, we understand sets and reps, intensity, percentage on the bar, RPE, all that kind of stuff. Us for practice, a sport coach, if you say, you know, what is the volume of practice? Well, right now we're in a 20 hour you know, week block. It's gonna be higher volume versus the summer where they only had four hours, it's a little bit lower volume. Intensity to a sport coach might mean the type of drills, 
half court versus full court, skill court, whatever it is, the drills are going to have different intensities. All my role is now with the basketball team is to apply internal and external metrics to what the coach looks at from a volume intensity standpoint and see if those are actually matching up. Uh, other data, I mean, this is just some basic heart rate data that you know you can show your athlete or your coach to start to understand like how the heart is responding. So this is uh, week one of an off season. The coach comes out and watches us run uh, 100s. Player uh, one handling it really well until it starts fatiguing at the end. The red he's getting up above 90% heart rate versus an athlete that took the last couple weeks off shows up above 90% the whole time. The coach sees that. One athlete's in good shape, one athlete's in bad shape. You show them the data, yeah, that makes sense. Again, just trying to like pattern that recognition. But then you can also show them, hey, that same athlete that struggled week one, here's eight weeks later, look at after we did this, his heart rate actually dropped. We actually had good heart rate recovery, and he's able to tank the heart rate after two minutes as opposed to still being up in a higher heart rate zone, showing them the progress of the training sessions. Three-minute drill comparison is something I used to do at Eastern. The coach, uh, middle of practice, would just call it a three minute drill and that's literally guys running up and down the court for three minutes trying to get as many line touches as they can uh, in the NBA the Celtics do that they call it the Celtic drill so he would do it in the middle of practice he'd do it at the end of practice from some heart rate data that we found in games most of the time athletes are on the floor in basketball the heart rate's already above 80 percent so coach's thing was he wanted to do the three minute drill but he wanted to make sure that they were above 80 percent the whole time and got used to that feeling of being under, uncomfortable as opposed to kind of revving up into it because while they're on the court they're already in that heightened state already so here just breaking down some data showing him hey player a here's a guy that could do that he hit the same amount of reps same time same heart rate zones player b things got a little uncomfortable for him uh, at the end, didn't hit that heart rate zone. Maybe late in the game, if you're looking for someone to push through when they're uncomfortable, maybe this isn't your guy. There's all different type of ways you can break down the data. It all depends on your relationship with the coaching staff and your understanding of everything that you're seeing. Recovery data, this is from this year. Obviously, quantifying recovery is gonna be big, but we had a rare uh, three days off in September. And then, so I just wanted to show coach, hey, you were a little worried about getting the guys three days off. He came in on Tuesday, highest recovery we've seen. They did a great job of understanding our culture, understanding what was expected of them throughout this weekend, how we wanted recovery, we wanted to handle academics, nobody was out partying all night. So if we came in and saw a tanked recovery at that point after promoting the recovery with the three days off, then we have an issue. So we want to start matching up what the players are doing with how they're responding. Then the last thing, you know, recalibrate. What's our interventions? What are we doing with all this data? Um, Again, everything we look at to me is supposed to drive conversations. I want filters for our filters. I want to be able to interact with the athletes and you know, kind of give them some autonomy. But the way I look at it, just the way the day is broken down, subjective models questionnaires, the first thing I'm seeing, then I'm seeing their QRT, then I'm seeing their jump data. Now I've got a real good understanding of where their readiness is at. Then I'm seeing how they're responding in practice, external, internal, and then knowing moving forward if we've got to make any interventions. Interventions could be basketball interventions or they could be weight room interventions. So what do we control? Again, for been doing this for a lot of years now. For some years, all I would really impact is what I did in the weight room. Again, it was about how can I be a better strength coach? How can I auto-regulate the training stimulus with our athletes and, and help better prepare them for what we're seeing? It wasn't about telling a basketball coach what they need to do, but here is all of our stress, right, uh, that we're imposing on the athletes and what type of interventions can we do? Coaching is teaching, I want to drive athlete ownership. So in the past, just as Coach talked about, volume and intensity was kind of like my go-to, right? If green, yellow, red, stop, late approach, like if I saw yellow, it's like, okay, yep, we're reducing intensity today. If I saw red, we're reducing volume and intensity, or there was different kind of protocols I had like that throughout the year. I, I'm not live and die by those uh, whatsoever. I, again, I try to educate the athletes and kind of have them make that call. Could change modality, something as simple as a bilateral squat, we're gonna go with a unilateral variation. Um, if we are seeing a significant downward trend in our recovery, maybe we're going off the script and instead of uh, going with more of a high volume, high intensity day, maybe it's a recovery lift. Maybe we're doing something more circulatory in nature, trying to like get the nervous system firing back on point. Or if the team is really burnt, maybe it's just a recovery day. So there's definitely been days where, you know, hey, I think, you know, I wanna get that third lift in this week but then we're really trending in the wrong direction. Maybe it is just a yoga session, or you know, maybe, maybe we got three good days in, and now, you know what, you guys, 
you earned it, let's just get a quick mobility session in. So we apply the, the recovery days in there as well, but I kind of give the athletes the option. We actually, on Friday, uh, did a, a recovery yoga session, and I gave the athlete, I said, hey, we could get that fourth lift in this week, or do you want to, and I was like, yoga. So like, I give them a little bit of autonomy, you know what I mean? Uh, basketball interventions, are we doing more training load intervention? Or are we doing better training load prescription? I would argue all the data is doing is really helping us prescribe training loads better. Educate the coaching staff on how we're modeling out our week, what we're expecting to see. Did we see that? How can we make a better intervention? So again, it's not so much intervention. It's not me sitting at a computer pulling guys and intervening with practice. It's more about taking the data. What? What, quantify the stress, how are the athletes responding, how can we apply stress better next time. That's our ultimate goal. Now there is interventions, obviously, if we've got a guy that is a, a high minute guy that we need to play on Saturday and it's Thursday and his training loads are significantly high for the week, we might tell the coaching staff, hey, we need to scale back Tuesday, Thursday if we want him to perform at a good level on Saturday. That stuff does happen, but the majority of what we do isn't pulling players, it's just better education and training load prescription. So. Are the interventions working? This to me is the value of overnight recovery, quantifying uh, HRV. Um, we all give our athletes basic prescriptions. Hey, get eight hours of sleep. Did they get eight hours of sleep? Did that improve? Was that a, a good recommendation? Uh, so everywhere I've been, I've had stories like this. Here's on the left, sample um, QRT data, HRV data from my time at CNU. So the top one, on the bottom right, 35 RMSSD, or you can look at the 42% quick recovery test. We got an ad, and this was back when the QRT was five minutes. It's three minutes again. This is from five years ago. Uh, athlete comes in, 42% recovered, very low RMSSD. RMSSD, that HRV metric, right now all of us are probably about 50. When you go to sleep, it might be up 80, 100, wherever it is. So 35 is really low. Hey, recovery's not good. What's going on? Uh, I'm sleeping all right. Did you get eight hours of sleep? Yeah, I'll get eight hours of sleep. He gets eight hours of sleep. Doesn't do anything, right? A couple days later, he says he's got eight hours of sleep for a few days. Still 35%, still really low RMSSD. Put the bodyguard on him. Realized he had stress reactions all through the day, stress reactions all through the night. Athletic trainer did some like manual work on him. And this is five years ago. Pretty much it looked like what RPR is, and like doing an RPR intervention. Got him diaphragmatically breathe, kind of de-stress, shifted to a parasympathetic state. Retested him the next day. QRT goes up, RMSSD goes up. So that was impactful for me as a young strength coach, just realizing we all understand what the interventions are supposed to be doing, and we always think the athletes aren't doing it, but what if the athletes are doing it and it's still not working, can we objectively quantify it and now make an appropriate intervention? So that's where this bodyguard stuff comes in. And I'm gonna wrap this up because uh, I don't wanna, I wanna be respectful of your time, but I also wanna make my flight. So, <laughs> uh, cute uh, bodyguard data. This was from uh, Eastern. So we had a guy like, "Hey, I just want to throw the bodyguard on you. We're on the road." I, they, to be honest, first we sent me these for free. I was like, "I just want to play around with them." So I did an overnight recovery on the top. Overnight recovery, 43%. Arm SSD was 62. The purple line is when he went to sleep. And I'm looking, and you see that purple line. There's a lot of red all throughout there. So I'm like, "Why is he having stress responses?" all through the night. So I was like, did you have the TV on? He's like, yeah, I sleep with the TV on. So I was like, okay, that's probably it. So now the next week we do it again. And I was like, look, sleep without the TV on. He's like, I can't do it. So we, we compromised, he did a sleep timer. So he puts the sleep timer on, and then what do we see is still stress reactions while the TV's on, but then as the TV cuts off, he slowly gets out of it, and then recovery goes up a little bit, but still not great, right? Recovery went up a little bit, arm SD went up a little bit, still not great. So me thinking back to that CNU situation, where athletic trainer did some manual work on the guy and, and got him to actually diaphragmatically breathe and, and promote good recovery. Now in the third week we're on the road and I'm like, let me do some RPR on this guy and see what happens. So before bed I do some RPR, get him, get him to uh, diaphragmatically breathe and, and I told him, I said, hey, no TV. Can you do that? No TV. We do the RPR, he knocks out, and now all of a sudden overnight recovery goes up to 70%, RMSSD goes up to 80 So again, to me, sleep is our biggest modality of recovery. I want to actually quantify it and set the guys up so we are maximizing on that. This type of data, especially correlated with a lot of the NBA research that's coming out showing like late night tweeting, corresponding with injuries or free throw percentage, all that stuff really hits home and resonates with our guys and kind of gets them bought into the process of, of owning their bodies, owning their recovery. Why is sleep and all that so important? 
you know, Fergus commonly you know, talked about this in, in his books, and it really made sense to me. What is sports performance? You know, real sports performance, you've got your tactical and technical aspect. There's a, a psychological aspect, the physical stuff that we all do. But sustaining all that is player health, the immune system, sleep, recovery, all that is going to be incredibly important. And so for us to maximize on on-court performance, we've got to be cognizant and aware of all that type of stuff. So, you know, all the data and everything is great, but the biggest thing for me is on-court performance. How are we doing as a team? Are we winning games? Is this improving us as a basketball team? Again, reverse engineer the game, but the big takeaway today is whether you quantify it or not, when you look at the game, readiness, training load, recovery, all that stuff is occurring naturally already. So we might as well better serve our athletes, objectively quantify it, and kind of set our athletes up for success. So again, thank you guys for, for having me here today. Thank all of you for coming out. Uh, if anyone has any questions, love to answer them now. My information's up there. If you, know, you need anything from me in the future, feel free to email me. Amount of metrics about these athletes. Yep. Constantly. If you're seeing someone who's not progressing in actual like game performance, how do you figure out like which of those metrics you want to start trying to push on? Uh, first is obviously looking at like the lifestyle stuff with him. Mm -hmm. uh, so for me, like the recovery stuff is going to be big. I kind of start with the subject of wellness questionnaire. Is are we getting the sleep we're seeing, all the nutrition, all that kind of stuff? Mm -hmm. Then looking at the objective and then diving into the training load. I think the training load, as coaches, we handle that a lot more than the recovery piece, right? So athletes are with us four hours out of the day, and they got 20 hours of the day that they're on their own. I know the stress I'm putting on them in the weight room. I'm educating the coaching staff on the stress that they're putting on them in practice. Coaching staff understands the stress of the game because they control playing time, so that's that high versus low minute uh, uh, data. So the first thing is really looking at all, all the recovery pieces and seeing if that's what's going on. Uh, but then diving deeper and just having the conversation, what's, what's going on in your life? Like, I've, I have a million stories I could tell you where uh, some of the recovery data is not good, training load, he's on point, on the court, something's up, what is it? And, I, oh, his girlfriend's pregnant. Like, there's so many different factors, but again, I think that's why I set it up. Everything for me is about driving conversations and, like, filters for the filters. There's a lot of stuff that gets missed as coaches. We've got a lot of different things going on. So that questionnaire where that, there's that last question, I kind of leave it open-ended too, just for them to express any concern and me be able to talk to them. We've had situations where like walk-on players want to be a part of the team so bad, but they literally have to like Uber in for Lyft at 7 a.m. and don't have anyone to drive them. None of the sport coaches know that. Maybe the players don't even know that, but because I set up filters for my filter, I'm the first one that gets to understand that and now there's more context around him, and maybe we can do a better job as a staff to help support him or get him connected with people and, and just decrease that stress level, make the experience a little bit better for him. Very cool. So I, I love the, the fact that I think when you look at all this information, I, it's daunting, there's a lot into it, and I think a lot of people sit here and they're like, I don't even know where to start, and I don't have access to that stuff anyway. So I love how you kind of painted a picture of like, hey, this is what we do. And I think that's one of the biggest concepts is if you're going to implement some of the things, it has to be something that you do as part of your daily routine. Can you just talk about the biggest hurdle, right? So you've got the software, you've got all, all of that component. So you've got the input, yep. right? And then you've got to figure out the output and what you get out of it. Yep. But then there's the recalibration piece, as you mentioned, and there's also this kind of coaching and athlete education process. Mm -hmm. What's the biggest hurdle that you've had with all of this stuff? Is it the input? Is it the output? Is it the, the adjusting? Um, or is it the getting everybody on board? Because we know how coaches are. Yeah. Um, so what's the biggest struggle with all that? I you? think so. This really all started when I was at CNU. And so now it's been five or so years. The buy-in and getting coaches on board at first, I think, is probably the first hurdle. You, they got to understand, hey, this has to be meaningful, has to be important. That's a tough hurdle to get over because once they say, hey, it's meaningful, it's important, what do they want to do? They want to see how it's changing everything right away, but first quantifying everything. So you got to get over that hurdle, you got to start quantifying everything. The next roadblock I hit was reviewing, pulling everything together. It's cool that we have all these metrics, but if I wasn't really good at Excel, I couldn't get some of the graphs, I couldn't get them to interact. 
it would just be just numbers and I wouldn't really understand or put context around it or have the quick visual where it gets you know green yellow red all that kind of stuff so the first thing to me was just like getting the coaches buy-in kind of explaining where you were trying to go with it and being patient with it the next was kind of reviewing the data and bringing it all in together again if you got the money for AMS I think that's the way to go because that's going to save you that process uh, but then the last thing again is just the, the logistics of knowing what questions you want answered. So like here at Buffalo, the big question was, can we match up what our practice plan is and what the drills are with physiological data? So if that's the question we're starting with and we know we want those answers, well, what is required of that? Again, time stamping the practice. So if you've got a sport coach that says, hey, that's awesome, I'd love to know what, what you know, the volume and intensity of these drills are, but you work with 10 teams and you can't make it to practice and no one's gonna time stamp it for you and you don't got the time to match those up, you can't do it, so it's just kind of sitting there and looking at what the questions are, what you want done, and then slowly moving through it. Awesome, thanks so much.